Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, everyone. I am honored to be joining this Davos agenda for this session, Rethinking Cities for a Post-COVID Future. I'm Penny Abbey Wardina, the Commissioner for International Affairs in the City of New York, and I have the pleasure of moderating today's session, and it is going to be an interesting one. Cities have really taken center stage as the world grapples to control and overcome the novel coronavirus. From shoring up our economies to managing health care to equity and in education, cities have had to step up to get people through these challenging times. In New York City, for example, we are working to ensure that no one goes hungry by providing free, free grab and go meals at more than 400 food hubs throughout the city. Last fall, we were among the only cities to reopen our public schools and have worked tirelessly to ensure that all children who need a laptop or tablet get one for free so that they can continue their education. Throughout it all, we have an eye on recovery and we are using the lessons learned from our experiences at the epicenter of COVID-19 this spring. Mayor Bill de Blasio has created a series of sector advisory councils to guide our efforts to reopen the city's economy, covering everything from business to tourism, from education to healthcare. The city has also launched the Task Force for Racial Inclusion and Equity, of which I'm a member, to ensure our response and recovery efforts are equitable and leave no one behind. And just yesterday, the mayor announced that the trustees of the city's two largest pension, pension funds voted to divest their portfolios from an estimated $4 billion of securities related to fossil fuel companies. The di divestment is expected to be one of the largest in the world and signals loud and clear our willingness to lead on climate action. Now more than ever, we need cities to step up and activate around issues of equity and justice. That's why I'm honored to be the co-chair of the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council of cities, uh, on Cities of Tomorrow, which is a multi-stakeholder think tank com comprised of city leaders, business executives, civil society, and academia. The council is focused on how cities can, redesign post, can be redesigned post-COVID-19 and build back better providing that climate, the climate and resilience, social and digital infrastructure and systems to do so, as well as rethinking traditional revenues and financing mechanisms to deliver livable, sustainable and affordable cities. And so I'm excited that in today's session, we will focus on the path forward for cities after, the, after this pandemic, which has not only highlighted the shortcomings in public health preparedness, but across a variety of issues, including social equity, inclusive economic growth, and sustainability, among other things. We will now start the first portion of the session, which will consist of a 30-minute panel discussion that viewers from all around the world can watch live streamed on the forum's website. This panel discussion will be followed by detailed conversation among registered forum members and participants. Now join me in welcoming our panelists today. We have Sridhar Gadi, founder and chief executive of Quantella USA, Cohen Van Oostrom, the founder and executive, a chief executive officer of EDGE, OVG Real Estate in the Netherlands and a fellow Young Global Leader, Jonathan Reckford, the chief executive officer, Habitat for Humanity USA, and um, my friend and fellow council member, Jan Vapiori, the mayor of Helsinki in, Phil in Finland. Now, Mayor, I want to kick it off with you. Um, as a fellow member of the GFC on Cities of Tomorrow and the mayor of a significant city, can you tell us um, how the COVID-19 pandemic, what it's taught you um, and other mayors? It's been an extraordinary year of first for, I think, uh, mayors around the world. Thank you, Penny. Good uh, afternoon. It's a great honor joining here you today. Uh, I think that the pandemic actually revealed more than it changed. It also highlighted some of the basic elements of a successful city. And then I think that it gave us a clear picture of how one should foster these winning attributes of a successful city. If I start with the first one, it is, I mean, it's clear, of course, that the pandemic changed a lot, but I dare to say, that, for example, digitalization and climate change changed more. But what is characteristic for the pandemic is that it actually told us a lot about our cities, of our societies, of our weaknesses, of our strengths. So you could say that it actually revealed quite a lot. It revealed that some cities which were successful already before the pandemic 
were able to come with a more successful uh, response to the pandemic as, as well. And it also told us that cities with structural weaknesses, especially in the field of healthcare, housing, segregation, data collection, were much more vulnerable. Uh, I think one of the outcomes of all of this is that cities today have a better understanding of the winning attributes of a, of a successful city, which I think is, is really important taking into account that we are facing a, a lot of, a number of uh, other global transformations taking place at the same time. Second, I think that it highlighted some basic elements of a successful city. When I took office as a mayor of Helsinki four years ago, I started by drafting a new strategy for the city, and I named, this, named it as the most functional city in the world. I knew from the very beginning that it was not a really media sexy uh, topic, but I, I was convinced that it was relevant. Today, I think it is, and it could be even a, a media sexy uh, topic. I think cities uh, which are reliable, predictable, functional, has showed that they manage this crisis much better than other ones. Another, um, I think, lesson learned was that those cities, those societies, those countries, nations, which are built on trust, where people trust each other, where people trust the authorities, have uh, managed the, the crisis better. Third, my third point is that um, you need to understand as a, a city leader in navigating in this difficult, rapidly changing world that you should all the time seek for a wide reaching systemic approach and systemic change instead of, of individual projects and, and, and programs. That you really need a holistic leadership, that everything actually counts that you should base everything you do on facts, evidence, science, and fourthly, that the better connected a city is with other cities, with the private sector, with NGOs, the better possibilities and chances you have to, to, to successfully walk through different kind of crises which we will face even in the future. Um, Mayor, no, that's an excellent point about the partnership needed with the private sector. And I want to also thank you on your leadership um, around localizing and using um, the language of the Sustainable Development Goals and using that framework um, and joining New York City when we launched the Voluntary Local Review back in 2018. Um, but that partnership between cities and, of course, the private sector, sector has been, um, I think, critical in this last year. And we've really seen how um, the partnerships built in the past have been really Really, um, the foundation of how we've been able to work together in this last year. Now, I want to go to Mr. Van Oostrom. Um, Cohen, the pandemic has drastically changed the way um, many of us, if not all of us, work. Um, is this the end of the office as we know it? Um, what permanent effects do you think this era will have on our built environment in cities? Um, would love to hear more from you on that. So uh, let me first say that I think that the jury is still out, and especially uh, when it comes to the office market, uh, it's clear that uh, that in, the, in in March we were sort of an, uh, on an adrenaline, thinking, "Oh, we don't need offices anymore; we can do things completely different." Um, looking back now, I think that uh, that we all long to go back into the office and uh, and work again uh, the way we did. Um, and I think that uh, that uh, the, the whole real estate industry is a little bit at a crossroads because there's a couple of things coming together. The first thing is that we all realize and we realize that before the crisis that sustainability and building is something that we really need to address. And that um, it is something where um, uh, the Green Deal is happening in, uh, in Europe. Um, the Green Deal is now also starting in the United States. And there's a lot of work to be done to, uh, to really change these buildings from being sort of like 30, 40 percent of emissions in the world and, uh, and make them uh, carbon neutral. The second thing is that that we want to make sure if we talk about buildings that we make them healthy um, and that uh, that it's safe for, for our employees to go back to the office, but also for people so safe to go into a shopping center, safe to go into a church and uh, or other places of, uh, of worshiping. Um, and um, the interesting thing now is that the technology is there. And the last couple of years, we've seen a lot of developments when it comes to censoring, when it comes to 
data analytics. And we are able now on a city level, but also on a building level, to be very precise and, and measure uh, how sustainable is a building, what is the energy management doing. Uh, if we measure that, then it's a small step to measure CO2 in a room. Uh, if you do that on a the room, then it's a small step to say, what does that mean for a virus load in a certain environment, in a certain space, and all these things we, uh, we can do. Um, I think that we will see in the next couple of years uh, a change in policy. I think that what is now abstract, where, where uh, President Biden and, and the Euro commissioners are saying, hey, we, uh, we see a lot of possibilities of, uh, of moving the, the real estate sector. We will now actually get carrot and sticks approach, where you, are, you get a reward if you really change your building, but you also get a punishment if you don't. And so that's going to be an exciting time where the real estate industry really has to move. A industry that is uh, typically not moving so fast, uh, a lot of owners that are sitting back and waiting for something to happen, but this carrot and stick will uh, really change that. There's one thing I'm not so positive about, and that is that what we're also seeing, there's a huge amount of social problems coming our way. Mm -hmm. Cities are also investment places. And what we are seeing with low interest rates is that there's a lot of people that don't see Let's, let's, Penny, let's take your city that don't see New York as a place to live. They see it as a place where you can invest. You can buy a piece of real estate and you can rent it out for a lot of money and you can make a lot of money, you know, doing that on a big scale. Now, at the same time, um, there's so many people that are starters that, that just need to live in that city, that need to work in that city, that have a family, uh, family that, that maybe also, you know, go out there and, and need a new place for themselves. And there's no, no place for that. And to bring together when we are on that cross crossroads, this huge amount of work to make our buildings, let's say, healthy and safe on the one side, sustainable on the other side, while taking into account that we have to change something on this, let's say, framework of investment and the way that, that governments and private owners of real estate are working together, not always working together, but at least functioning in the same domain. That's going to be the big challenge, and that's the one thing on the social part where I may be less optimistic because the technology is there to solve the sustainability part and to save and to solve the uh, the part on the on the health. What will it lead to? Um, we think in the next couple of years, for example, offices will be amazing places to go into. We have to seduce our, our people working for us to come back into the office. And so the office won't be filled with desks anymore. That the work you can do everywhere, you can do at home, you can do that in a coffee shop somewhere. But if you come to the office, you come there to communicate, to, to sit around the coffee, a machine and to to hang out and have random meetings with people uh, so the fun of work and being in the in the office is going to be a lot bigger than it was in the past Tones, you, you somehow got me both excited and stressed out with that. <laughs> There's a, a lot of opportunity. Um, but in, in, later in the session, I want to come back to the, the challenges that you talked about with, um, with public health um, and sort of public good, even though sustainability, you think, is something that um, we can achieve um, looking forward. I want to um, transition to Mr. Gadi. Um, you know, this is, uh, you know, and excellent time for technology. Look at us here uh, right now. Um, so it having played a really big role in fighting the pandemic in cities, allowing us to work remotely um, and to be safe for those of us that can, um, it's clearly going to play a crucial role in, in building back. Um, can you sort of take us through how you see this playing out? Sure. Thanks, Penny. Hello, everyone. Um, pandemic accelerated digitization. You can see working from home, or studying from home, getting urban services from home. But post-pandemic, not everything may not be working from home, but it will be hybrid. People would like to have option to work from home, study from home. So this is going to be a huge acceleration of digitization. At the same time, this is going to create challenge in the society with a digital divide. All over the world, around 50% or more people doesn't have good internet and laptop to work or study from home. So one, how do we solve the digital divide problem? So we at Quantela solved two problems. One, how do we fight COVID? Then second, going forward, how cities can help accelerating digitization at the same time, helping with reducing the digital divide with fighting with COVID. Before pandemic, most of the cities all over the world have done some kind of work on smart cities, building command control centers, 
but mostly or none of them have really focused on converting command control centers into COVID war room platforms. So what we have done is within two weeks of pandemic happening, we converted around 29 cities, five state governments, and a couple of countries, the city level command control centers into COVID war room platforms, integrating different sources of data, different departments data, like healthcare, hospitals, police, disaster management, social welfare. By integrating all the sources of data, how city administrators can get a situational awareness, understanding the COVID cases, predicting what will happen next, availability of hospitals versus demand to pre-plan and predict and serve the society. Now coming back with acceleration of digitization, like water, like power, I think cities will have to start giving, providing uh, free access to internet. But several cities with pandemic, less and less taxes collected, may not have enough funds to digitize the infrastructure and digitize urban services. So we have come up with a model called outcome-based model. You can also call it public-private partnerships. I'll just give you with one example how we have done it, where we solved the acceleration of digitization as well as solving the digital divide problem. There is a city called Erie in Pennsylvania. When we met the mayor, he said that certain part of the city, students were not getting good grades. When they have done further study, they found out that certain areas of the city, kids doesn't have proper internet and they can't do the homework. They had to go back to school to do the homework. The city mayor said, how can you help me to provide the free internet access and uh, accelerate the digitization at the same time, city doesn't have to spend so much money. So what we have done is we have digitized uh, their lighting, converting into LED, converting into smart lighting, and city saving 50% of their power savings, we could reinvest that money into providing free Wi-Fi services. And once you have a smart pole, once you have that infrastructure, and you can have a camera, then you can have uh, environmental sensor where you can understand the pollution levels of the city. With a camera, you can understand crime in that area. You can understand traffic in that area. So at the end, by coming with innovative pricing models, innovating outcome models, you can provide economical, environmental, and social benefits to cities. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and that was a great um, example, you know, it's because I'm going to be transitioning to Mr. Ruckford, who um, leads um, Habitat for Humanity here in the U.S. And something that um, some people uh, mistakenly talked about was how this pandemic would impact us all equally. And it has turned out to be, um, unfortunately, completely the opposite. It has, in fact, relieved um, some of the really longstanding disparities we often talk about here in New York City. Um, it really pulled back the curtain um, on issues that we we, we knew were there, um, but it really just hit us hard last spring. Um, I want to use this time. Um, the the forum has, has dubbed this period the Great Reset to ensure that our cities are rebuilt in an inclusive and equitable way. Um, how do we actually do that in a way, you know, I like, I love, you know, Cohen talked about the sustainability. Um, we've been able to, to think about it from a built environment perspective, but how do we talk about it too um, from impacting the people, the citizens um, in our community? Thanks, Penny. I Obviously, you know, as a housing organization, we think housing is going to be the answer to many things. And certainly it's only one piece of the much more complex puzzle. Um, but in many ways, it's a prerequisite. And if we don't solve housing for all of our citizens, then all the other things we want in a healthy and sustainable city won't take place. I think COVID has shined a spotlight on how critical adequate housing is to health. And we're seeing all the public health issues as we ask people to shelter in place all over the world. How do you do that if you don't have a place in which to shelter? So if you care about health, you need to care about housing. Um, as you said, we had a global crisis in affordable housing before COVID in virtually every city in the world. And this has just been exacerbated and has exacerbated existing divides. I think for those of us who are knowledge workers, this has been a deep inconvenience. For service and frontline workers, this has been a catastrophe. And I think we've seen uh, how much equity issues have been exacerbated where now, 
uh, over 90 million people have been forced back into extreme poverty, and those numbers are growing really rapidly right now. If we, if we think here in the U.S., uh, historically, there's been a racial component of that as well as we think about equity in, in terms of access to housing and particularly access for some communities. So as we think about equity, we need to address housing. And that's an issue globally as well. We believe certainly that the best model uh, in all contexts are mixed income, mixed use, transit oriented development so that people can live close to where they work so that lower income families have access to the better schools, to better opportunities, to paths forward. Uh, and that's both environmentally better, but it's also from a human perspective, the best model. But that's not um, how our cities are currently working. There's been an increasing economic divide where we've segregated economically, which is really impractical. And we've seen an explosive increase with low interest rates and the cost of land that has risen so much faster than incomes. So affordability has become a gigantic issue. Uh, and in many ways, most of our major cities, as we look at mass, uh, rapid urbanization, and I think when we talk about knowledge workers being able to live anywhere they want, that's true, but that's a very small segment of the total population of a city. So as we think about uh, investing in more equitable, healthier, and also economically sustainable cities, we've got to figure out a way to house all of our people. That's right. Um... This is, uh, I think this is going to be the, the challenge for the, for the coming years. Um, I'm curious, I, we, there's a question in the, cat, in the chat before I get back to, to everyone else um, for Sridhar. Um, it's about technology. I think it speaks to um, the questions that are, that are coming up um, from the panelists. Now, how can technology and innovation be leveraged um, to catalyze the establishment of smart cities in this COVID era and beyond while simultaneously addressing the critical challenge of ever-expanding informal settlement and urban housing challenges in the least developed and developing countries. Um, that Jonathan just did um, sort of a brilliant overview of the challenges, especially um, focused on affordable housing. What's the role of technology here, especially when we're looking at um, developing countries? Developing countries like India. Uh, yes. Do you want me to exactly. So you're saying the technology role in, see the, the role, depends on the country the let's, priorities let's try, are if it's if you if you can choose the country i think the question is can this moment be leveraged to catalyze smart cities and in these areas that are having these historical challenges absolutely i think uh, pandemic kind of situation definitely will accelerate uh, city administrators to take you know right decisions right policy making and uh, especially policy making on data privacy mm. is going to be uh, expedited and what we have seen is especially providing urban services to citizens which especially touch the end citizen is really getting uh, expedited Okay, that's great. Um, there's a question here for um, the mayor. Um, somebody wants, uh, has a question that's about the actions on diversity and inclusion you're developing um, on the future, the future city strategies. I could maybe link that to the um, points uh, Mr. Breckford um, elaborated on, on just a moment ago. Uh, I, I really, really much uh, believe in, in what he said, that uh, housing is a prerequisite for, for many other things. And I also believe uh, in the thing that what, what he mentioned, that a, a mixed housing model is, is to seek for, for a success. Uh, when he told that more or less no city uh, in any, any place on earth had, had really followed, this uh, I would like to, to tell you that we actually in Helsinki and in some other Nordic cities we have. And what we have had done is that we have done that for the last 30 or, or 40 years. And we have really managed through this policy to, to, to create a city uh, without any like ghettos, without any really bad surroundings, without any really bad neighborhoods. And, and, and of course, the, the, the challenge is that, that even for us, which have been quite successful, we have uh, been forced to do this for a very, very long time. But I mean, this shows that this has also been a, a, a basics for a real inclusive city. This has 
creative trust, and trust is then the, the basic prerequisite also for inclusiveness and, and issues like this. So, so maybe I would like to like underline that everything counts, and, and the basic prerequisites, uh, especially housing and a well-functioning healthcare system, are actually building a basis for several other good things which we are aiming at. I think that's a good, um, I'd like to offer Mr. Rockford an opportunity um, to, to weigh in. Um, you know, I'd like to hear about where you're seeing this work um, being catalyzed in a positive way that perhaps pre-COVID it wasn't. And so it's giving you um, reasons for optimism as we're thinking about how we're rethinking and rebuilding um, uh, this future of cities. I, I'll split it into two contexts. I think in the um, lowest income context, we're still early and sadly in the health crisis. And so there's probably more pessimism, I think, in terms of the challenges, and especially for families living in informal settlements. We've got almost a billion people living in informal settlements and the health conditions are extremely high risk. So the focus there has been on water and sanitation and improving health conditions so that they can get through the pandemic. I think in higher income contexts, I think the reason for optimism is the awareness is much higher. In some ways, it got bad enough in our most expensive cities, Penny, you live in one, where essentially, um, you know, all, even middle class families have been priced out of the market. And we know that's unsustainable. And, we, and we're starting to see cities take policy changes to move more towards what Helsinki has done, which is to say, we're gonna allocate land, we're gonna put in uh, some kinds of different requirements, but you need both incentives, carrots and sticks. So I think where there's inclusionary zoning, where there are land trusts or other ways, or and where there are ways to mitigate the negative sense sides of gentrification. So as cities have developed uh, in the high income cities, what's happened is low income families and traditionally uh, less developed parts of the city are getting priced out or pushed out. And I think they're really creative ways to mitigate the property tax increases for low income homeowners. And they're also ways to create permanent affordability so that we can uh, have inclusive growth uh, mm -hmm. because growth is a good thing. The other side, maybe particularly US phenomenon, but we've seen in many cities is that there are zoning regulations that essentially have forced out. Uh, they were originally designed to be racially uh, enforced but now they're economically enforced that essentially have kept out low income or moderate income housing. And we're starting to see more awareness of the need to uh, increase supply. Uh, but it really is, a, that's a changing hearts first and then you can change policy. And that's a that's a fair point is the, um, just the awareness that people have of the disparities, which has driven this, you know, desire for, for changing the, the structural inequity in a way that we haven't really seen in such a long time. I wanna give Cohen a chance um, to, to jump in here because you work um, with you know, local governments uh, you know, around the world. And I'm just curious, you know, um, Jonathan just talked about carrots and sticks. Um, from your perspective, what do you think, have you seen work either for you or for your industry? Um, would love to hear about that. Well, <clears throat> what I find so interesting is that there is so many different models are being tried out and if there's one thing where i think uh, the the mayors and, and leadership of cities can can better work together uh, i give you one example berlin um uh, berlin has made a, a rule that you cannot rent out um, um a space anymore a, a residential space for more than a certain amount of money and it's illegal and literally you can get a huge fine or even go to jail as an owner of a of a, of a house um, if you um, uh, rent it out for too much money. Um, but that is, a, that is a revolution that is given an earthquake. Um, the market is reacting a little bit like, oh, wow, and, and they stop building. And so it's a policy that is a, a, a huge step, maybe not completely in the right direction. But the interesting thing is it's now being copied by, by other cities. Other uh, cities are looking at it. And I think that on the policy framework, uh, it is going to be so important that um, that cities are really going to compare notes. And I know that we have the the, the, the C40 in the World Economic Forum has uh, different places, different platforms where, where leadership of cities are, are coming together. But still, I think that there's so much more possible that we bring all these cities together. I think that, that the, the Dutch uh, and the, the Scandinavian cities have great examples on, uh, on showing uh, what, what carrot and stick can work not only on the social part, but also on the part when it comes to the sustainability. Uh, also there, we see too much experimentation. And, and as an international real estate company, it is sometimes also a little bit difficult to try to comprehend what people are trying out in Berlin and then relative to Amsterdam, relative to London, relative to 
cities like Boston. Uh, and every time you sort of have to try to find your way. And sometimes we try to inform these other cities about, you know, best practices that are happening at other places. But cities too much see each other as competitors. Uh, there were, I think, for 99% of their work, they have the same issues and they could work together uh, a lot more. That was a great um, point to actually end this first uh, part of our uh, our discussion. Thank you all so much for, um, for your uh, very honest and candid uh, comments here.